Here now, in the new generation, the Tiguan wants to set a new mark and saying, hey, I'm top of the segment here. But is it really true? We'll find out with Thomas Nadegefühl in 4K, full screen, full length. Let's go with the all new Tiguan generation. Different trims, different engine versions we arrived today as well. And here you can see this one is the Arrow line. There's a lot of sporty accentuations going on in the lower part, high gloss black and this mesh front grille. And we have here as a comparison the Elegance, this is the other top trim, more this horizontal focus, more chrome styling, so yeah, a little bit more elegant approach. And the base version would be closer to this than it would be to this one here. The R line also has more high gloss black all over the vehicle. And in general, the styling before the Tiguan was more like I would say a little bit more you know, angular and so on, now more round shapes to improve aerodynamics. So it went down from 0.33 to 0.28 in the CD value, which is good. CD value always better when it's lower. Not necessarily in the 20 inch wheels, R line and so on. This is worse aerodynamics wise, but the overall aerodynamic form has really massively been improved. You have these air curtains here, air going through here and here, going through the wheel arches then also a more round hood. Then here it's closed actually. This whole light area is closed, you can see, and more aerodynamic optimizations across the vehicle. And you can also see that here, this light integration, it starts here. Then there's the light strip. The Illuminate VW logo, not yet. It will follow later. They couldn't get it ready for the Tiguan when it was launched right now but then it will come at a later stage. And the light logic is you have a base headlamp, already LED, then you have a higher performing LED, and this one is the optional. Optional matrix LED, so-called IQ light for best high beam performance. And then you also have the cascading turning indicators, both in the front and in the rear. Oh, and Leah found some Easter eggs. Look at that from the outside, hard to see, just when you have the hand behind it. There we go. There's the tiger. You could also better see it from the inside. Aww. And the other side has an iguana. Hmm, so cute, but why is that? And the reason for that is that Tiguan is a combination, the name of tiger and iguana. Tiger, iguana, tiguan, you know. I think it's nice to implement that giving. And now the most important thing is, it's not an option, it's not only in the R-Line or on the Elegance, it's even in the base trim. That's something special for Volkswagen, right? Major step forward also as for the noise insulation, the soundproof front windshield is standard and then option you can get an acoustic package. And here at the side windows, front and rear, we have then the dual insulation also equipped with our test cars today. 4 meters 54 or 179 inches is the length of the new Tiguan, just slightly longer than the previous generation. This one here, the Elegance version, or also the base trim, would have the matte wheel arches here. Wheels from 17 to 20 inch. These ones here are 19 inch wheels in this rather closed aerodynamic design. Then more of this matte cladding here all around. But already here in the Elegance, you have this shiny frame trim around the windows. And you can see this is more or less a conservative design. You have a dropping line right here. More form follows function that you have space on the interior. And now coming to the R-Line, if we move over to our second vehicle, you can see more high gloss black. For example, around the wheel arches. These ones are also the optional 20 inch wheels. With the R-Line, 19 would be standard. 20 then also optional for the R-Line. Here in the black styling, the most sinister styling, R-Line badge. Once again, the closed look right here and aerodynamic optimizations here. They make the car longer here, also with the top spoiler, so the wind can better flow away right there. That makes so much difference. Also here, see these edges right here? This is also optimization for aerodynamics. And it's actually even more important that the car is not getting pulled from the wind in the rear than how much it pushes in the front. So rear aerodynamic optimization is actually the most important thing. Very interesting. Elegance here, the matte, more plastic styling with the chrome accentuation, whereas we have in the R-Line once again, high gloss black and this meshed grille structure once again for the sportier, more sinister look. And not sure if you can really see that, but the R-Line 
top spoiler here is even a little bit longer. So although the Arlan in general is worse as for aerodynamics, this longer spoiler would be then a little bit better. Oh, very important by the way, this middle light strip and also later when the logo is illuminated will also be active while driving when it's dark and the main headlamp unit is also on. Pretty cool, right? Technology-wise is actually the biggest news, the DCC. We have both vehicles here equipped with that, the diesel we're driving later as well. DCC has been upgraded to a DCC Pro that now employs a two-valve system. So it's more elaborate and can rule more between comfort and sportiness. And even in the infotainment system, you can not only choose presets, but also individually rule that. Here, this new central knob, either manual volume adjustment, that's good, would work when I have your music running, and then you press it, and then you can either have here the driving mode selection directly, comfort sport, and so on, so easy to select while driving. You can also slide in this one here, and then select the ambient lighting modes. Not sure if it's necessary to have that here, but yeah, it's an interesting function for sure, like this. So, and then you see what you are selecting, but you can also go deeper in the menu. And then here with the individual modes, this is just information. But here with the individual mode, I can have more settings. And then you can also individualize this DCC setting from minus to plus. This is the most comfortable one, this is the sporty ones. And the interesting thing is, it's not only here then. So when you, for example, set it here, it rules between approximately this spectrum. When you have it here, it's like in this spectrum. So it's always plus and minus, but this is kind of like the preset. However, I personally recommend rather a comfortable setting to have an elaborated ride. Still, we'll find out more when we drive the vehicle. Key fob, high gloss black, not my favorite. Door closing sound, VW is always famous for that. And here, it's also good. Nothing super special, but good overall. Here inside, this is like a bright trim. The R line would be darker. Deco element is already right here. I love the door inside handle, which is in this matte silver trim, actually. And what's actually quite cool here at the inside, we have felt covering at the inside door pockets. Elegance trim with the elegance entry badge. Also here the normal steering wheel with real buttons on the steering wheel. So they have returned to real buttons for all versions, actually. VW says they want to use more real buttons. Again, good decision. Also, we here, our community in Autofuel has massively influenced that. And then the R-Line steering wheel would have here a perforation and also a logo in the lower part. Other than that, the steering wheel is the same. And then these are the Ergo Active seats. You would start base with fabric seats. Then there are usually microfiber seats for elegance. And this is the optional animal skin trim. Here in the bright styling, you can also get the dark stylings, of course. The thing is that VW in their ID models, in the electric models, go forward in all animal-free and sustainable materials. Whereas in the models with still have combustion in the say like, what the hell, we don't care about sustainability. And that is not consistent. Why would you do that? Why are only electric vehicles supposed to be better as for the rest of the materials and the features? I don't get it. This is definitely something to criticize. However, you can get a really nice microfiber seats here also for the Tiguan. Um, they perform even better than these ones here. They are softer and more comfortable and more breathable actually. Then here with 189, six for two, lot of room still above my head. You can also get the panoramic roof still. Steering wheel, manual control in and out, up and down. So the base ergonomics, actually really good. You can find a good position also as a tall driver. And uh, Leah has already seen that. Yeah, I saw that with the camera. Here, the switch gear, like in the ID7, forward, reverse, directly here at the steering column. That cleans up the lower middle console where we showed you that new, you know, functionality button. Interior cockpit overview here in this trim is bright here. And also this illuminated trim here the elegance version. So we have this deco element, Tiguan it says, and the R line it says the R batch. So it looks a little bit different then, but it's only available in the top trim versions actually. Then 13 inch would be standard. This is here the optional 15 inch screen. It's optional for all versions actually. Yeah, hmm, typical options policy. The sliders are now illuminated. It's good to have them versus only in the screen, but manual would be better there in the very, very new generations of the Volkswagen vehicles, the manual climate knobs will be coming back also thanks to our coverage. 
Then here you can also directly select the seat cooling, for example. And here the digital instruments behind that. This is covered with an anti-reflective coating that you can better see them. It also has more a matte appearance, I would say. And you can also change, for example, the view in the digital instruments. Sorry for that spontaneous burst of rage. Here, when you have a door opened, then it does not work to change the view. You have to click OK first. Then you can also switch the middle view. Here, for example, also with a full map like this. It's somehow also complicated what you want to have there because then you have to go back or here to go close again. You can control the inside parts actually. Um, yeah, but then you can also go to the outside here on the right. You can go to the left part. I think a little bit over engineered. I think others could say it's highly customizable. The infotainment system now has this new back and also has more CPU power, for example. And then here, this is also a main menu you can select. The plug-in hybrid has the static air conditioning. You can even select the zones you want to preheat or pre-cool then. And now where can I adjust the head-up display? Hey, Ida. Head-up display higher. You can adjust settings on the screen. So then it brings me to this menu at least and I can adjust the position. There we go. And my favorite feature for the head display is you can pick this snow mode. So when everything is white, then the number here, the speed turns to blue. I would maybe drive it like this always. Hey, Ida. Hey, Idaho. Ah, wait, it's, it's hello. Hello, Ida. Why do you keep interrupting me? Oh, that's something I still need to learn. Yeah, that's what I, that's what I said, right? Yeah, so, yes, the software has become better, definitely. But that's something that uh, sometimes it gets activated and then records everything you're saying here. Um, oh, that's something I still need to learn. Yeah, you know, and then you not you haven't activated it yourself, but just becomes active by the activation word and then it's telling you something. So what I usually do that I deactivate this activation words and I just use the button on the steering wheel then for the input for the voice uh, system. That's usually better with most vehicles. With the console space above and then underneath two inductive charging pads. They charge quickly, very nice and are also cooled and USB-C charging. So here this lower middle console. You have these sliders here in the front. You can also take them out completely. Then you have the cup holders at this moment far in the back. Hmm, but does it really make sense? However, you have the choice. You can put this one out. Then, okay, well, I know how to do that yet. Then here you can put this one here and put it to the forward position. And I think that would be, there we go, more suitable for bottles in the front. And then, something I still need to learn. Not sure why the voice assistant. Stop. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> well, you see, um, yeah, this is definitely better now, is it? Rear doors, hard pack. In the front door, it's soft. Here is actually hard pack. Huh? <laughs> huh? Well, for that price, I would expect something different. And then here, the rear bench, you can slide it forward or backward. You can also adjust the angle here, like this. Um, Wait a minute. Ah, there we go. So like this or all the way back. Then the middle part, slide down and you have um, <laughs> ah. Ah. Yeah, I remember with the static review, I had some problems with that as well. So these are the cup holders. Hmm. Let's say, I wouldn't exactly say I'm very convinced of this new mechanism. Let's take it that way. So, then here, the other seat, you can see how the angle is varying. There we go. And we can also slide this one forward or backward. And when I'm in the backward position and I'm driving on the passenger's... I'm driving on the passenger seat? What am I talking about? When I'm driving in the driver's seat, that makes sense. Here, there's still a lot of legroom left, no problem. And headroom here with one A9 or six for two. 
also no problem. So it's a good offering of space here in the rear. And then we have also USB-C chargers and also seat heating for the rear when this are powered. Trunk and luggage capacity. It's also cool to do it here two in a row, <laughs> two for one. 650 liters for the normal setup, 475 for the plug-in, but what are the differences here? Normal combustion engine, a meter or 40 inches in width, that's the same. The length, 88 centimeters or 34 inches. It's just more luggage capacity because you have more room here in this area. And we also have, for example, you can get a 220 or 230 volt normal plug to fold the seats. Pull this one here left, pull this one here on the right. Why doesn't it fold? Ah, okay. Yeah, that's because the electric seat function that goes automatically back. I'll soon fix that. First of all, here underneath more space than in the combustion engine version. You can also house a complete replacement tire here because here the subwoofer, when you have that option, is now in this form here. So it leaves space for a replacement tire or for the plug-in hybrid battery. Soon going to show that to you. So I need to put that electric seat more forward that the rear bench can actually fall down. That's the thing with these electric functions. So they automatically go back for comfort seating. And then we go here. This is then the length as I would be seating as a tall adult, 170 in meters, that's 67 inches. And now the question is, what about the plug-in hybrid? Let's move over. So on top here, it's the same just here on the side because they put the small, the 12 volt starter battery right here in the left part because they need the space for the plug-in hybrid parts other, other, you know, in other places. And then the high voltage battery is placed right here. That's why you lose the little figure underneath, but you can still have some space here for charging cables. So this is then actually the main difference. As for engines, well, I love that dual shot here right always <laughs> then we have a 1.5 tsi and it's the base engine two horsepower specs in the 150 horsepower specs it's around nine seconds in the acceleration figure always m half mild hybrid system and also the dual clutch transmission seven speed dsg on that base of the 1.5 tsi is also the plug-in hybrid version new with a 20 kilowatt hour net battery 80 kilometers or 50 miles of real world realistic range. So massively improve the plug-in hybrid electric capacity. It's also important for taxation reasons, for example, especially in Germany. Then there will also be a two liter TSI, both with all wheel drive and the two liter TDI, the diesel, also in two horsepower specs. The bigger one we also drive today, 193 horsepower, also with all wheel drive, the latter one. The big diesel is then the one with the highest towing capacity at 2.3 tons. The other one then depending on the engine version a little bit less. So all of the engine specs have more or less their advantages or disadvantages. Welcome to Thomas' driving lounge on your Tiguan, testing different engine versions. Here starting with an all-wheel drive version of the TDI. So 7.7 .7 seconds in the acceleration figure, so a little bit stronger and let's see how that behaves. From 40 kilometers an hour, we'll accelerate it out. Let's go. Plop, 100. Oh, that even triggered the Lia meter just a little bit, a little bit. Yeah, just a little bit. I mean, she's used to like really sporty because now that's yeah. Yeah, so decently quick. And when we're driving in the city and so on, then you hear this typical diesel nailing, we say in, in Germany. So, yeah, rather unpleasant sound indeed. But here on the motorway, the difference is rather minor. I was also picking up the sport mode. I can go back to the comfort mode, then the RPMs go a little bit lower. And then actually at higher speeds, the difference between the engines is not that relevant, I would say. And here now on the motorway, one kilometer an hour, we can also experience the driving assists, here travel assist is also then upgraded for this vehicle. You set it here, you pick the different mode, travel assist, limiter or ACC, and then you set your speed then also on the steering wheel and here you set different 10 kilometer steps and with resume you can set one kilometer steps above, here at the moment 110. And it's really good to have the real buttons back for all versions so it's easy to press these real buttons then. And let's see how 
good does it handle? It also shows me green steering wheel symbol. That means it's the active lane keeping assist. So the car is doing that yeah, semi-autonomously. So it's level two. And so far, let's see how the car is being centralized quite well. Now there comes like this slight bend in the motorway. Let's see how the steam reacts, if there's any hectic movement and so on. Yeah, that's actually very smooth. Yeah, flawless. That's really good. The steering, in, indeed, I would like more feedback, but what you can also do is go to an individual mode. And in the individual mode, um, yeah, to do the while driving is a little bit complicated here. You have to go there. And then you can set the, the, the DCC, the adaptive suspension. But you could also put, for example, a soft suspension, but then the steering to a sportier node. And yeah, that's maybe also a, a good choice in long term have your personal individual mo oh thank you for the heads up <laughs> interesting overtaking maneuver by the truck yeah but here good on the brakes also good reaction from the steering you don't have to turn the steering wheel that much actually and what's also really cool here one click on the assistance systems i can easily click there lane assist is deactivated and also this u speed warning oh i deactivated it in advance even <laughs> no one has seen that. So it's really good when you're annoyed by some systems, they need to be on always at start of the vehicle now by, you know, by just mandatory from the law. So the manufacturers, the only thing they can do is make it easy for you to deactivate them. And that's exactly what they did here. So I think hats off to VW that they... Am I just praising VW for something they have done on the software side? That's a premiere. <laughs> so yeah, usually it's always that they have great chassis, great suspension and so on, but they were lacking behind in software. And now they're also picking up with the software things and finding good customer oriented solutions for the software, like here with the um, deactivating of the assistance systems. So that is actually a good thing to test also while driving, that you know that it's actually easily uh, handleable. What I also feel here on the motorway, so the acoustic windscreen in the front is standard. This one here, by the way, also the one with the heating foil. And I don't see any, I, I don't see any heating foil. You know, there are two solutions. There are these, you know, like the, the individual heating lines in there, the old technology. I always see it and it's like, I can't drive that way. Some can, some not. And then this is like this integrated foil. And it looks like there would be nothing. Still, it's a heated front windscreen. The only problem would be if you have polarized glasses on, then you can see some reflect. I think it's still manageable, it still works, um, but that's the only thing you could maybe see some, you know, I don't know. I haven't seen it myself yet. Did you? Maybe? I'm, I don't know. Oh, now we can drive 130. Let's see, 110 to 130. Oh, I need to get off the motorway actually. But you see, also um, good on the brakes as well. Nice to put the turning indicator in. Yeah, so it's actually good reaction also from the drivetrain, from the brakes and so on. Overall good feeling. And that was like, you know, always like more than one kilometers now, more than 60 miles now. And the noise insulation is really very good here. So the set the front windscreen is, yeah, we have a beeper. Front windscreen is standard insulated. And this one here is also equipped with the optional insulating pack so that means then that the side mirrors back um not side mirrors, the side windows front and the back also have dual insulation and we felt that it's really very silent in here definitely more silent than the previous generation then the better aerodynamics um that also uh, you know come come together so that is um yeah, that's really good, especially for longer motorway trips. Super silent in here. The whole vehicle feels from driving actually really premium. It feels like a premium ride. I love that. Um, what I really want to test, probably the most exciting thing, because we have the new DCC here. So when we go here to the individual settings, now set really to the most comfortable DCC sitting. So just feel how you know, the individual waves are being evened out feels really soft. I mean, it's also a quite good road, but you know, there's some waves in there, but that, that feels really elaborated, like, you know, more upmarket segment. 
now let's put to the sportiest setting. Uh, yeah, touch driving. Let's go here. Wow, that's notable. Now you, you know, you you feel like these individual bumps in the road way more clearly. That's interesting. Wow. I mean, now of course we have a little bit sportier Whoa. feedback. <laughs> yeah. So here, sportier feedback then. <laughs> we go a little bit slalom like. But now let's do the slalom again with the most comfortable setting. I mean, the slalom reaction is actually quite good in both cases. Hmm. So I wouldn't say when. Let's do here again. What do you say? Yeah, in slalom reaction, it yeah, doesn't yeah. doesn't differ that much. It's more really when you're running over the bumps. Yeah. That's just like bumpier in the sportier setting, but you have a little bit more feedback from the road. But actually, I would drive with the most comfortable setting, honestly, because the car doesn't feel unsporty from suspension here. It doesn't lean too much in the corners. But then again, it's such a smooth ride. So my tip here definitely would be individual mode, steering to sport, and the DCC all the way to comfort then you have a great driving setting here actually. Now the plug-in hybrid and I try to do an acceleration electric only. Let's see if I can manage. Well, that was 0 to 50. It could be a little bit quicker but I want to be gentle because when I use the pin down then also the combustion engine goes on. But you can see you can even accelerate quite quickly all electric. This is also the focus of this new plug-in hybrid, that it's more electric than before. Not only with the higher range, the bigger battery and so on. So, realistic range around 80 kilometers, always depending on your driving profile from this 20 kilowatt hours net battery. But also in general, smoother and just more silent and less combustion engine. For example, before when I go here to the S-shifting mode, Usually the combustion engine would hop on, but that's not the case here anymore. And also when you select the driving profile here from comfort to sport, it also doesn't go on. So before the engine went on, now it doesn't do that only when you really apply the power. And we can also compare that. So for example, here in the comfort mode, let's see when we hit the throttle. There we go, it's on. But here in the sport mode, the thing is that there we go, we have more response from the engine as well. And you might always wonder, hmm, isn't it bad for the engine when it suddenly hops on at a high RPM? Of course, it's always better not to do that in a way, but sometimes it's, you know, maybe needed. So I asked the VW experts, what do they actually do as a countermeasure? First of all, like the coating from the inside of the cylinder is a different one. It's a you know, more elaborate, stronger one that helps against possible bad effects on the engine and also if the engine is not running at some point they use then you know a little bit of oil that's running through the engine to just you know, to give it enough fluid that it doesn't run dry that you don't have bad effects on the engines then in, in that respect so there are some countermeasures as for that so that you're not <laughs> the broken plug-in hybrid engine pretty quickly but I would you know I would recommend to not maybe have the situations frequently and uh, yeah, try to gently push the engine on them. But at some point maybe it is needed for safety reasons and so on and at least you know that you can theoretically do that. So here also the transitions, they also work on that, that the, you know, all electric driving and then the mixed hybrid driving, you also have smoother transitions in between and you also have better recuperation. So when I hit the brake pedal, its recuperation is also more possible in total than before and also there the transition is better than before. What's also interesting is that we can change the recuperation levels but it's not we don't have like a B mode here this is still the S mode which is predominantly then for the hybrid driving when the engine is on so you need to adjust the recuperation modes then in the infotainment system. Yeah doing that easily while driving is not yeah, it's, it's actually a little bit complicated, to me at least, as for the driver. But we have set here our hotkey. Thank you, Leah. So, um, yeah, 
she's the best recuperation expert. <laughs> so on the, yeah, we have yeah, yeah, <laughs> exactly. And then um, Leah can select between low, automatic, and high. So lower, it's like a lift throttle. There's mainly rolling, you know. So and then we have automatic or oh. high. We can whatever. We can start with high. So when I accelerate and then foot of throttle, there's more recuperation. You can also see that in here. It's not exactly a super strong one pedal driving feeling, but it's notable definitely. An automatic, which would be the standard setting, is also checking out like the ACC, is there a car in front of me or not? Or also according to the topography changes on the map. That's uh, very interesting. And even more interesting, since they homologated that with the low setting, you can have all of the three modes and then restart the vehicle and you have it in the last mode selected. And that's good because maybe you favor one mode or the other and then you just stay in that mode. Yeah, at some point you have to recharge 11 kilowatt AC, 50 kilowatt DC peak. So that then will take you 25 minutes from 10 to 80% state of charge. That is also massively quicker than it was before. So the whole plug-in hybrid system is more usable. You might wonder why do they employ such a high buffer because when I say 20 kilowatt hours net and maybe you read on you know some spec sheets like 25 26 kilowatt hours that's the gross figure and they have such a high buffer that they can maintain the same value for you as a customer for the whole lifetime of the vehicle the battery does lose some capacity over time yeah but not like the whole buffer in a couple of years you know that's but I think it would still be better that you offer more from the start, maybe then you lose a little bit um, over over a couple of years, but then I had more before. So um, yeah, but that's definitely a, like a strategy thing they decided. If you use both powertrains at the same time, you know, like here in sport mode, when you push it on, you can even have a better acceleration. Let's go. Ooh. Oh, that's 80. Hmm. That went quick. So, because the plug-in hybrid drivetrain here will be the second quickest in the lineup, quickest with around six seconds in the acceleration figure, will be the 2-liter TSI with 265 horsepower on overdrive. drive. This one here, front wheel drive only. You maybe also heard and felt that we had some wheel spin in the front, so much power just in the front axle. Now the pure petrol engine, 1.5 TSI. Let's go. That's 80. Little bit downhill though. Hmm, I mean, acoustic wise, the coolest <laughs> I feel. Have the pure petrol engine sound. Of course, it's in a way that also the slowest of the ones in the test today, but it doesn't feel like that. So, yeah, and you have a quite natural feeling to that engine here. Weight wise, if you ask yourself, hey, the plug in hybrid, is it much heavier? It's about 250 kilograms, so there are like 500 pounds difference. This is not that you would extremely feel that in most situations. So at the same time here, the TSI is the lightest and it kind of also feels light in a way, but not that the plug-in hybrid, you would say, hey, no, this is heavy and this feels completely different in the handling. In the handling, they are all really good, really good indeed. We have to see if, you know, also reliability and software and like electronics um, keeps up to that, uh, that level. I cannot promise that, but from suspension that is really great and how the car feels as you know as a whole just you know two days earlier we've been driving the Peugeot 3008 which is the exact competitor also we have driven it in the all-electric version though so can't one-to-one -one compare it it's also uh, available with the comparable engine though and we have to say we both experienced that talk to Leah about that too that this one here the Tiguan it's maybe more conservative in the interior styling wise and so on but it feels so much more elaborated because of that great suspension and the steering feel and so on this is something where, where it really really shines especially with the dcc now called dcc pro so i can really recommend to go for the adaptive suspension maybe not all the other bells and whistles but the suspension is really something you, you should go for. Engine or the drivetrain is always a combination of entry price and the usage. Taxation reasons might push a lot 
for the plug-in hybrid. Yeah, that's probably also then a good choice if you can save a lot of money, especially with the company car. For most private use, then here the 1.5 TSI might just be um, a good pick. And also consumption-wise, well, you can also score some good values around 6 liters, 1 kilometers, like 40 mbg US, 50 mbg UK, in really good ideal conditions using that MHEF smart hybrid drive system. If you have some more dynamic driving, rather towards 7.5 liters and 1 kilometers, like 30 mbg US, 40 mbg UK, this would also then the latter autos count for the TDI in the all-wheel drive spec because that also consumes some more fuel. So there you see that TDI and TSI come very close. Only when you go like really high-speed motorway, then the TDI can catch up and is very good in the consumption, relatively low. Whereas the petrol engine has a wider span of consumption, so the TDI doesn't vary so much in the consumption. That's the thing. And the plug-in hybrid drive, then you can only always say it depends how much electric driving and how much petrol driving you do for that hybrid drivetrain. Now, definitely good to compare the competitors of the Tiguan.